Hi, my name is Mary, and during the month of August, I read 10 books, which I'm going to talk about in this video wrap up. I'm going to start off the video by talking about the fiction books that I read this month, then move into the nonfiction. And then at the end of the video, I'm just going to briefly mention the books that I have made other fuller videos about so that I'm not repeating too much. So let's get right into the books. The first book that I'm going to talk about is called Unbecoming by Rebecca Sherm. This book follows a young woman named Grace. She has left behind an ex-husband and a lover in prison in the United States. She has fled to France where she works as an art restorer. She has fled not only to escape this husband, but also to escape the legalities of a crime that she helped perpetrate, which is the reason why her ex-husband and lover are in jail. So over the course of this novel, she grapples with the morality of what she has done. And we have dual narratives that are her in the present day and then her in the past. And we kind of get a sense of why she was orchestrating this crime and what her relationship was and how the lover came into the story. Um, and then we also have the present day where she's working as the antiques restorer. This gave me serious the goldfinch vibes and for that reason I was very excited about it. However, we run into the serious problem that there is not a single part of this book that I liked. Whether or not a main character is likable to me is not really the problem that I have with most novels. I'm perfectly okay to read about an unlikable main character if they are compelling. And I did not find Grace, the main character of this novel, very compelling. I thought that she came across as flat and kind of stupid, actually. I really struggled with trying to understand any of the decisions that she was making, both as a, as a young person and like just having relationships and during her crime sprees. So it I really struggled and I was hoping that the plot of the novel would actually make up for that. Like she would face some growth or some vicious character comeuppance or something that would help. However, over the course of this novel, that just wasn't the case. Over the course of the novel, while Grace is in hiding in France, she is terrified that her husband and lover, when they get out of jail, will come to find her. And so there's this kind of thriller element as she tries to maintain a really low profile. However, the problem with that is that when eventually somebody comes to find her, which was telegraphed on page one and like is super obvious, the there's no stakes. Nobody ever takes like a gun and threatens her or a knife. She goes along with what's being asked of her for no reason. And then their whole plot of the story is supposed to culminate in this realization of Grace not being a moral character, which I found really frustrating to read because yeah, it was clear. It's not like a realization if your character is just garbage from page one and never evolves. It's not like a big reveal. Anyway, I gave this book two stars. It was not something I would recommend at all. I will continue to look for books that are in the vein of the Goldfinch, especially ones that star female characters, but this was not it. Next, I read Wolf in White Van by John Darnell. So John Darnell is the lead singer of The Mountain Goats, which is my favorite band, but I had never picked up one of his novels until this month. I picked it up actually on my own birthday to try to give myself a little reward for all the stressful stuff that was happening with the start of school. Wolf in White Van follows the life of a man who is caught up in the legal proceedings surrounding the write-in role-playing game that he has been running as a business for the past couple of years. He suffered facial disfigurement as a result of an accident. The details of the accident are unveiled over the course of the novel. And so this is how he communicates with the outside world and the role-playing game is organized around a world that he developed while in a hospital and recovering from this horrible facial trauma. So we follow kind of two threads of plot. One, the thread of what happened in this court case, um, how he is involved and how his role playing game is involved. And the second is how the, the facial trauma came to happen, how he became disfigured. The course of this novel I found very compelling. It's very short. I think the audiobook is six hours or so. So even if I'm not listening to it fast, it was, um, it was very compelling. It was very quick. 
I think some people, and myself included, would have liked it to be a little bit longer, but there's nothing in here that doesn't need to be in here, and so it is a nice tight story, so maybe I just need to pick up one of John Darnell's other novels rather than hoping or wishing that this one were quite a bit longer. I would say that there are elements of this that I really liked, one of which is his absolutely beautiful and lyrical writing. Of course, as someone who is a massive fan of the Mountain Goats, there is a quality to his choice of words and his observations, um, especially a sense of longing that can come through in the, in the way that he structures sentences and lines that made this book a beautiful aesthetic experience as well as appreciating the plot of it. I think in the end I gave this book four stars. It's not perfect. Again, I do wish it had been a little bit longer, that certain parts of it would have been fleshed out. So it's not perfect, but it is very much enjoyable. And it's something that I would recommend to other people. So if it does seem like something that you would be interested in, if you like the mountain goats, if you like Dungeons and Dragons or similar pen and paper roleplay games, if you're interested in the ways in which a character's kind of flawed past can be brought up in the in the present, I would recommend this book and I'm going to be looking up other works of John Darnell in the next couple of months. Next I'll pick my Next I'll talk about my classic pick for the month that was this book, The Book of the City of the Ladies by Christine de Pizan. I picked this one up for Women in Translation Month as it was translated by Rosalind Brown Grant. This is a medieval work. It was written in the early 1400s by a woman named Christine de Pizan. It is a rhetorical defense of women, which is basically constructed in kind of an allegorical sense as she literally builds a city for virtuous women to live. This is often referenced as a early feminist work because Christine de Pizan is engaging so many of the extremely prominent both classical and medieval European misconceptions about women. A lot of the misogynistic kind of language that was written about women during this time. And so she basically tackles every argument head on with historical examples and uh, makes a logical case for how women can be just as virtuous as men are. Of course, because this was written in the 1400s, there it's not a feminist text, I would argue. It is a defense of women, but only some women. She makes it very clear over the course of this text that she is defending virtuous women and the women who she deems to be not virtuous. For example, sexually promiscuous women and sex workers or women who are not Christian or the women who have um, participated in crimes. These sorts of things are not the kind of women who she is advocating for. So. With that in mind, I do think that this was a positive reading experience for me. I'm trying to read a lot more medieval literature, and if that's something that you're also interested in, definitely keep your eye on this channel so I can talk about it more. The thing is that for this, the medieval literature was extremely easy to follow. The translation by Rosalind Brown Grant was wonderful, and I think that this is something that if you're interested in kind of the general field of women and gender studies, if you're interested in the Middle Ages, if you're interested in rhetoric or in um, the construction of logical arguments, if you're interested in medieval history, this is definitely something that I would recommend picking up. I'm actually writing one of my research papers this semester on this and other works by Christine de Pizan. So uh, this is something that I would like to talk about. If you have also read it or if you have read any other Christine de Pizan works, definitely let me know. Or if you have read any other works from the Middle Ages that you would recommend that I read on this channel and talk about more thoroughly. I don't have a lot to say about this next one, but it is a collection of contemporary poetry. This is called No Matter by Jana Pinkroll. This is a collection of poetry by a well-known poet who is writing about the urban experience. It's called like an elegy to the ongoing moment, and I don't know what that means, and seemingly neither does she. So I did not like almost any of the poems in here. I didn't find the style compelling. I didn't find the subject matter compelling. There were no lines that really stood out to me and made me think, wow, that's a great poem. I want to write that down. So with that being said, this one was not for me. I did give the uncorrected proof in a Goodreads giveaway, but it's not something that even 
after giving it, I would say, was worth reading. It was just, just not for me. Next, I want to talk about nonfiction. I would love to bring up this book, Voices from Chernobyl, The Oral History of a Nuclear Disaster by Svetlana Alexievich, translation by Keith Gessen. This is a work of nonfiction, which is all about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. I read another book about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster last month, and this month I picked up this one for Women in Translation Month for trying to read a book by a woman that was nonfiction that was translated. This book is magnificent. It really, really is. I think that there are a lot of people who could benefit from reading this book, and it's one of those books where if you're going to read about Chernobyl, it's high on everyone's recommendation list, and it would be high on my recommendation list as well. I don't know how she does it. The passages in here are directly from these people who she has interviewed, but they are powerful and lyrical and emotional. They read like fiction. They read like powerful, like first person prose poems. They're quite amazing. There are a lot of sections in here that I have tabbed. The content is, of course, because it has to deal with the with the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, it is disturbing at times, but I don't know how... I can't put that as like a negative, it's just something to keep in mind if it's something that you're going to be looking at in the future. I am honestly amazed by the quality of this work. It is absolutely a five-star read for me, and definitely something that I will be recommending to people for a long time to come. Lastly, I'm just going to briefly mention the books that I want to discuss that are in other videos on this channel already. So these five books were all in my Book From Every Country wrap-up in August. I read Eve Out of Her Ruins by Ananda Devi from Mauritius. I read Salwa Al Nemi's The Proof of the Honey from Syria. I read the collection of poems Sounds, Feelings, Thoughts by Wisława Samborska from Poland. I read Layla, an Egyptian Woman by Fazia Assad from Egypt, and I also read The House of the Spirits by Isabella Allende from Chile. So definitely, if you're interested in hearing my fuller thoughts about those, I have a whole nother video devoted to the books that I read from international literature this month. Alright, so there goes my extremely short August wrap-up. Please let me know if you have read any of these books and then comment down below and we can talk about them or if you have any recommendations for what I should read for the month of September. Thank you very much for watching. Bye!